So we're going to be talking about making church great again, but before we do that, this past Friday was the second annual Athel Baptist Church Cornhole Championship. Now, for those of you that missed it, you missed a great time. We had sent out an invite because we wanted hecklers to come. I mean, cornhole is not fun unless you have people heckling. Um, so unfortunately, I had to take the role of scorekeeper and heckler. Um, but I did want to take this moment to pass the cornhole muster on to the next team. So if I can have last year's champions, um, Leslie and Aiden, come up with the cornhole monster. So we've got a couple things. I'm kind of meshing a few things here, right? So if you're familiar with hockey, the Stanley Cup, right? You, you drag that thing around. They take pictures with it. Every, go ahead and come up, please. Um, this is a big deal, right? So if you get the Cornhole Monsters, a champion, you get to take this thing around wherever you want to. And so this is their picture <laughs> with the Cornhole Monster, right? If you earn the Cornhole Monster, you get a chance to take it wherever you want to and get a picture to be immortalized in Athel Baptist history forever, all right? And kind of like the Masters, when you pass the Cornhole Monster on you, you pass it to the next champs. Now, this last championship was thrilling. We had four teams, uh, the Varneys, McCoys, McDermott's, and the uh, defending champs. Now, I had created this wonderful bracket, and somehow they defeated it, and we ended up with a three-way tie, and the sudden death thing that I come up with didn't work, so we had to on the fly go to sudden death shootout between the McDermott's and the Aldersons. It went uh, two rounds, and unfortunately there was some choking happening, so the McDermott's, if you'll come up... <laughs> So, is there anybody get a shot of this passing? Does anybody get a phone on them? Thank, yeah. We, we need this for Athel Baptist Facebook history. All right. So, the passing of the cornhole monster has been done. So, Craig and Kimberly, you now have the cornhole monster, and it's up to you to go take a photo more worthy than that. And, uh, sweet. Thanks, everybody. Round of applause for Craig and Kimberly. Now, we're going to try to do the Winter League this year, so I invite more people to come. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's part of being part of a church. Craig, don't leave. One, I got one last funny for you before you leave. So Craig was probably the MVP of the series. He has his taco throw. He probably outshone everybody. And Craig's secret weapon is he works in the nursery. Just saying. Just saying. Ask him. But what's also funny before Craig leaves on this post that was from last year, at the very bottom, you have this post from this mysterious Craig Duane that says, just wait till next season, Kimberly and I are bringing the thunder and lightning. <laughs> so we won't say he's a prophet, but he uh, brought the thunder and lightning this weekend, so thanks, Craig. All right, so as always... Hey, we're part of a church family. We got to have fun out here. You got to do. We got to do things outside of just coming and singing and listening. We've got to live life together, right? It's the point of a church, and it's nice for me that I've had that intro because it's going to parlay right into uh, what I want to talk about today, which is make church great again, all right? Chris isn't feeling well, so if you have complaints, uh, Greg at AthabaptistChurch.org. The more fiery, the longer they are, the better. He loves it, all right? So send all your complaints there. <laughs> so I don't want to be nostalgic, and I didn't grow up in the 1950s. Would y'all start the timer for me, please? Um, <clears throat> but it seems that I don't think anybody would argue against, even with the imperfections of that time of life, that the local church had a much more prominent role in the American life than it does today. I think we can all know that there's been a drastic decline in the local church. I think there's three things. There's a multitude of reasons why, but I think there's three kind of things that have led to this. And each one of these that I'm going to talk about is oxymoron. Now, oxymoron is just a rhetorical device where you take two words that have opposite meanings and you combine them together to create an idea. Obviously, a phone is not smart, right? There's nothing smart about a phone. It is a, simply a tool, right? <clears throat> So why is it that these have created a decline in the local church? 
Well, I think these devices have affected us both socially and individually. Socially, it affects how we deal with both strangers and friends. I mean, people live on this thing and they get on like Facebook and do all these things and we polarize ourselves to the sense that you feel that, okay, if you're not a Baptist and you're not in this part of the world, I can't even relate to you. That is such nonsense. We need to go back to a time where the more different somebody is, the more willing you are to engage with them. So what makes life interesting is people being different, right? How boring to all be cookie cutter of the same box, but what these devices do is they, they continue to categorize people, and you, see, and you can see this vividly in just the polarization of our politics where it's just this rabid hatred between the left and the right. Not saying one's right or the other, it's just a, a demonstration of, of how polarization does not uh, lead to good things. Individually, these devices create very narcissistic, selfish individuals. It's all about me, 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 me. You know, I travel on my job now, and I can tell you when I get in an elevator, when I go anywhere, this is just people sitting, like, I was telling my wife, I had to check into this one hotel, uh, I can't remember where it was, but they were having a prom or something that night. Literally a prom, right? So one of the biggest events in your young life and the amount of girls that were sitting in groups together, literally on their phones, at a couch. Like, I'm like, what is going on? Like, you're literally not even socialized in this big event in your life. You're sitting there on a couch beside each other looking at a phone. And that's all, we all find ourselves doing this. So I challenge you and you, when you're out in public, break that paradigm. Don't be the kind of person that, like, you've got to walk 20 feet and you've got to walk doing this, Right? This can be a tool or it can turn you into a tool. You're the only one that can make that choice. Now the next thing that I think that is causing a decline in local church in our country particularly is what I refer to as negative blessings. What do I mean by that? We live in probably one of the most affluent, one of the most amazing societies this world has ever experienced. It is imperfect by all means. It, 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 we have our imperfections, but... I would challenge you to go back and find any society that has the advantages that we have today. I mean, for goodness sake, in the middle of winter, you can eat a mango in North Idaho. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Or an avocado. Like, it's, I always joke, I'm driving in my car, and my mother who lives in rural Alabama, and I will be driving, and there's a couple dead spots on my way in rural North Idaho, and I will get irritated that I can't video FaceTime my wife on this, or my mother from Alabama on a phone. Do you understand how insane we've allowed ourselves to become? But these blessings, I refer to them as negative because a blessing is something that draws you closer to God. Society, you see this when you're out witnessing that one of the biggest hindrances to people coming to God is the fact that they have everything. They've made themselves. They have no need for God they feel. So that is one of the things that monetary things, materialism, all this is not always a blessing because if it doesn't draw you to God, it is not a blessing. Now then you say, okay, well, it's, it's, it's a sin to be rich. No, it's not. It comes down to what you do with what you've been given. If you have things and you use those things to bring others close to God, to bless others, to give, etc., to be generous, then that is a blessing. You're using it as God has intended, and you're likely to receive even more because you're doing what God wants you to do with it. Whereas if you don't have much, and all you do is obsess over that and hate people who have, right, that's not a blessing either. You're not blessed because you're poor. It's what you do with what you've been given that matters. And you're the only one that can answer that question. But I think we would all agree in today's society People have too many things to do on Sunday than to worry about coming to church. And Sunday's not the only day you can meet, right? This, we can get in that discussion another time. But people have too many distractions on their free time to give any of it to the children of God. They've got to go watch football. got to go shopping. They've got to go um, fishing. Name whatever it is. It doesn't matter. None of those are sinful in and of itself. But the fact that we can't make time for God and his people defines it's a negative blessing. We have too many things. Now the final thing I'll talk about 
in terms of the decline is the online church. This is an oxymoron because you can't have church online. It's not a thing, right? And those of you who are watching online, I would say if you're sick, that's fine. But if you need to be part of a local church, and I'm going to really hammer on this today. And I'm not saying if you want to go listen to your favorite pastor, you want to learn online, there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But don't call that church. It's not church. Church is this. Church is coming together, learning people, knowing about people, working in the nursery, playing cornhole, all the things that come with church, right? It's connection. It's having relationships. It's actually doing, as a reminder, there's only one thing that you're going to take from this side to the other side of glory. One thing, and that's relationships, right? So there is never a bad investment in relationships. But I'll argue there's a lot of times we make investments in our time and our talent and our treasure and things that are going to mean nothing on the other side of glory. But you will never waste an investment when you invest in a relationship with someone else, be they a believer or be they lost. But you cannot do that if you're sitting at home watching your favorite pastor, eating some popcorn, growing in growth, blah, 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 blah. You've got to come here and deal with hypocritical, rude, nasty people. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, you know, some things don't have to be mentioned. Um... <laughs> Now, I don't think it's too helpful to sit and just focus on the negative. So I want to get on to the positive, right? So it is what it is, but we're here. I don't want to preach to the choir. So let's talk about some things. Why should we make church great again? Well, I think the first reason is we need to recover the power of the church. And the way we do that is we unify. We are living in an age now, Jesus can decide to have a revival whenever he decides to. If you're, if you're looking at the times, it does not seem that that's in the future. My opinion, it seems like the train has gone over the tracks and the coaster, and, and we are headed to the last days, the days of Noah that Jesus talks about, which in that reference, he's talking about implicit, explicitly what he's talking about is people are going to be eating and drinking, just living life with no concern for God when he returns. But I think the other thing, the other implicit, the other thing that's implied in that statement is that people will be completely unconcerned with God, and they will be like uh, what he said before the flood. They are completely sinful. All they think about is sin all day long. Did I talk about these yet? What do these do? What do these foster? These foster people just going into an abyss of sin. We live in one of the most selfish societies. I mean, think about it. We, li we are living when what Romans, first chapter of Romans talks about, where people are to the state where they call evil good. I never thought I would watch ESPN and watch them literally champion a dude wearing a female swimsuit and beating other swimmers and act like this was good. I never thought that that, I mean, it never occurred to me that would become reality. And that is literally the world we're living in right now where, where we have people champion, people dressing up as girls and going beating girls that girl sports, and we have feminists, right, who fight for women who sit there and cheer them along too. Like, what nonsensical world are we living in? So the, re the reason we have to unify, and the verse I have up here, and I'm going to read all these, but I'm going to highlight them. I encourage you to write them down and read them and study them on your own time, right? we got to do the wave tops. But what Christ is telling us here, and it's a reminder that if they hated him, the man who was perfect in his love, perfect in his mercy, perfect in his relationships. They hated him. How much more are they going to hate us? His followers who are imperfect in our application of grace, mercy, etc. So it's so essential for us to unify because we are going to be hated by this world. And after Baptist specifically, we are always going to be hated because of a one single reason. Obviously the proclamation of the truth of the Bible, but part of that truth of the Bible that we're proclaiming is that sin is is always sin. We will never back down. This pastoral staff, if we go down to 10 people, we don't care. We are always going to preach the Bible. We are always going to declare sin is sin. 
And that is why this world is going to hate us. And the more these generations move along, the more of an enemy we become, the more hated we're going to come, the more lies they're going to tell about us. Um, I heard somebody say this one time, and it really provoked a lot of thought. And he talked about the fact that when people were martyrs, when they got martyred, they weren't like, oh, here's a person being martyred because he stood on the truth and he's not backing down the pressure. No, when people are martyred, what do they say about him? He was perverse. He was a liar. He did, right? Like, they're going to martyr you and they're going to lie about you and recognize the fact that we are going to be hated as this world goes along because we are going to refuse to say that it's okay for a boy to dress up as a girl and go beat girls in competition. We're never going to say that. This world is going to hate us. We need to recognize this, and so we need to come together. We need to unify. Bible Proverbs talks about it. Strength is found when you come together. A 3-4 cold is not easily broken. We've got to unify in this time. Are we going to have differences? Yes. Are we going to have people who eschatologically think about end times differently? Are we going to have different opinions on uh, whether God foreordains you or he, you know, the whole soteriological, I'm sorry to use these big words, but how God chooses. Like, we're going to have all these differences, right? But these are not the essentials of the faith. God is one. Humans are depraved. Jesus Christ is God. Uh, Jesus is human, right? Grace, faith. These are not the essentials, right? If we differ on the things that are not essential, it's fine, but we need to unify. We are going to start becoming the minority rapidly. Now, the next reason we need to make church great again it's our duty. If you claim to be a Christian, if you say, I am a follower of God, God himself asks, why do you call me Lord and not do what I tell you to do? One of the singular frustrations as a pastor is People not understanding the purpose of church, not understanding the power of church. Thinking that this church is about you is wrong. If right now you think, I need to come to church to get fed, to get inspired, uh, to get anything, you're wrong. If you claim to be a Christian, now if you're not, if you're not claiming Christianity, then yes, we want you here so we can give you the gospel. But if you claim to be a Christian, you need to mature to the point where you recognize the fact that you are coming through those doors to give what God has given you. And Jesus has commanded it. So there's a spectrum. Well, I'm going to get in the spectrum later, so I'm, we'll come back to this. But it's our duty. And recognize the fact that my children have a duty, right? Their duty is to obey me regardless if they like it or not. And I am kind of hit or miss. Sometimes I give good commands and sometimes I, I tell them to do something. I'm like, okay, that wasn't wise, you know? Like we went dirt biking the, uh, the other day and, you know, I was getting frustrated with my youngest because he just wasn't riding very aggressively, right? So now I'm like on him. Like, you got to ride aggressive. We can get out there. So next time I guarantee you he's going to see a hill and be like, dad said ride aggressive, he's just going to launch himself, hurt himself, and he'll be like, you told me to ride aggressive, Dad. Right? Hey, I did. I did. Right? So what I'm trying to relate is, as an earthly father, I'm not always going to give the best advice. I'm trying to figure this out as I go along. But our eternal father, when he tells us to do something, we know with 100% certainty it is the best thing for us. There's no doubt when God commands you to do something, it is the thing that is best for your life. It might not be the most comfortable, it might not be the most pleasant, etc. but it is the best thing for your life and his children. So when he's asking us, why are you not doing what I tell you to do? He is saying, why do you not trust me? Your job is simple as a child of God. Just do what God says, listen and obey. And then you will start to understand the power of church. If you simply obey and come, you will start to understand the power of the church. We often misunderstand what a calling is. When we ask for help, people are like, ah, I don't feel called to do that. What does that mean? What, what does that, find me anywhere in the Bible where it says your calling is going to consist 
of X, Y, Z, or find me examples where Moses or anybody who God asked them to do something said, you know what, God, I'm just not feeling that. That's a great plan. That's a great idea. It's needed, but I'm, not, I'm just not feeling that, right? I don't feel called. Let me define for you what a calling is. If you are a child of God, if you claim Christianity, a calling is this. There's an opportunity. You can do it. That is a calling. It is literally that simple. We have nursery needs. Can you watch children? You have answered. That is the call. That you don't need more. You don't need to, to want to change. You don't change diapers. But you don't need to want to hang around with little rugrats for an hour. That is not the definition of calling. You simply just need to be able to meet the opportunity that is there. That is the definition of a calling. And that is our duty. Now, the last thing in the power the church has the power to do is to reveal, to, to provide us re with reality. Here you see that Jesus, when he's talking about false prophets, he talks about the fact that good tree can't bear good fruit. Now, that's not to say that people who aren't believers can't do things that are good. That's not what this impetus is about. What it's saying is that over time, you will see that the fruit that false prophets bear is not fruit that leads to the kingdom of God. This is what it's saying. So recognize that one of the things that church does is it helps reveal for those that may be claiming Christianity but are not Christians that they truly are not Christians. So let me, let me tease this out for you. There's a spectrum when it comes to church. Church attendance will never... Make sure we say that. All right? There's no amount of church attendance. You're not going to show up at the Bema Seat Judgment and Jesus say, all right, well, of the 72,000 times you could have gone to church, you went to church uh, 35,000 times a year in. Like, this is not a thing. Church attendance will never save you. But what a church attendance does, just like what James talks about, it's not the good works this saves you, but the, what the good works does is authenticates what is genuine in your life. One of the most essential things to do, and we're going to get into this, is coming to church so you can give to God's children, so you can do what God has commanded you to do. So if you're unwilling to come to church, if you're unwilling to commit to a church, there's literally only two possibilities here. You're either actually not a believer because you don't love the people of God, you're not doing what God has said, how can you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I ask you to do? So that is the extreme. And how horrific would it be to grow up going to church all these times and stand before God and Him to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And there will be people who sit in a church for 30, 40, however many years and just think they're a Christian by association. Only God knows a heart. Talks about that when he selected David out of his brother's. Only God knows the heart, so there's no way to know, but you can tell by the fruit. And if you yourself, if you don't like going to church, you don't love God's word, you don't pray, you don't do all these things, you need to really take assessment of what it is you believe, what it is you're trusting in. So that is this end of the spectrum. The, other, the best end of the spectrum, the best, if you are not committed to a church, if you're not going to church, if you're not giving of yourself to church, the only other, the best in the spectrum is, is you're a disobedient, immature believer. That's the best case scenario. Again, church attendance is not what saves you, but it authenticates what's in your life. If you have the Holy Spirit living in your life, how can you not come to church and love those, love your brothers and sisters? How is it possible? How is it possible to have the Holy Spirit who has infinite love, mercy, and grace? How is it possible to have him in your life and not want to come and give of yourself to others. I would say it's not possible. And if you question that, if you don't worry, talk to a person with a red man, talk to a pastor. We are more than willing to sit down any time. Now understand, I'm not saying you don't have eternal assurance. I'm not saying that you, get, you cannot lose grace. Grace is a gift. But what I'm saying is, a lot of times when you see someone who falls away from the faith, someone who... Uh, who used to believers now, what has actually happened is they have claimed Christianity. They, they've claimed that God is their king. But what's happened is God has given them a series of events in their lives to show them that they're not actually a believer. Think about Job. 
I don't know if, probably not many people have gone through worse things than Job. Not once did Job ever say, this has happened to me, there must not be a God. He did say, why God? I don't understand. This shouldn't be happening. Like, those are all valid things to say. But not once did Job say, you took my family, you're evil, there must not be a God. But if you think about life, so many people who don't believe, things happen in their life and they say, well, man, I can't afford this car. I didn't get this job. You know, my, my wife is mean to me. It's, there must not be a God because these things are happening. So a lot of times, people will go through a life thinking they're a Christian, and God will do things in their life to show them the reality that they are not a Christian. And if you despise church, if you can't go because it's full of hypocrites, right? If, that is a pretty good indicator of where you fall out in the spectrum, in my opinion. Is church difficult? Absolutely, right? We're all people here, right? I don't think anybody's perfect. But as you grow in the faith, the love of the Holy Spirit should drive us to come together and to give of ourselves. So let's get into this. How do we make church great again? Somebody drop their Barbie doll, by the way. <laughs> like some random Barbie doll up here. Um, all right, so how do we make church great again? I, we got to remember for the purpose of church. The first thing, and this is, I, I hit on this, if you think that church is about you, the songs that are sung, getting inspired, I'm not saying that that's not going to have effect. I'm not saying you're wrong if you're inspired by the preaching. I'm not saying you're wrong if you come here and sing your heart out and it's a blessing. I'm not saying, understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying any of those things are sinful. I'm not saying any things are, are wrong. But that is not the purpose Right? The purpose is for you to come through those doors and for you to serve this church, i.e. all the other believers. That is the purpose of church. So if you're not doing something in this church, you need to find something to do. We have job openings in nursery. I, mean, I, I still have to joke about this five years into preaching, Right? Francine, she works on the video, right? You have a talent. There's something you can do to serve this church, and that is the purpose of church. So find it. Do it. Will it be uncomfortable? Yes. Will it be awkward? Yes. Will we ask more of you? Yes. Here's the thing I want to say. When you volunteer, you've got to set boundaries, right? With any relationship that you have, you've got to set boundaries to be healthy, right? My wife is good at setting boundaries. She's like, Richard, there's only so much of you I can handle in a day. So these are like <laughs> your hours, right? She's an amazing woman. She's definitely getting a gold star when she goes to the BMC. <laughs> but when you volunteer, you've got to tell us, hey, this is when I can help. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with saying, I'm available for, at your disposal from Monday, Friday, 8 to 10, whatever it is. I can help this. I can. You've got to do that. You've got to set boundaries. You've got to be able to say no. You know, you've got to be able to say, hey, we need your help. We need, I can't do that. Okay, that's, that's okay. And for those of you who are families, your first mission field is your family. Do not destroy your family because you're out doing of the God. Intense. It's like a golf ball, right? A golf ball you can hit that thing like 400 yards or something like that. It's got a, the core, right? As a man, as a leader of your home, you have to have a strong core. In my opinion, one of the reasons why, one of the qualifications of a pastor is that his children are obedient and is in line because it's validation of the fact that he can lead his own house, that he invests in his own family. You've got to have your mission field first and foremost is your family. Few things are more heart-wrenching than losing your own families to a lost world. First and foremost, your family. So when you do serve, you've got to set boundaries. You've got to be able to say no, but you also have got to step up. There's so many ways. I know Carrie can use people to help her with uh, greetings. 
right? We have so many areas that we can use help. I need somebody to help me with cornhole next year, right? There's so many areas. Just stop a red lantern and say, you know what? I'm available to help. Serve. And it's, one, it's like a diet, right? I can speak to you until I'm blue in the face that uh, drinking more water, avoiding sugar, exercising every day, uh, avoiding certain foods. I can talk to you blue in the face that those things are wonderful. But until you literally do it and commit to it, and are consistent with it, you will never feel, right? You will never feel the joys of service until you start serving. Until you join a candlelight service and you sacrifice hours practicing, you sacrifice your Christmas Eve coming here, which you get some of Tootie's wonderful to catering, by the way. That's a little pitch there. But until you do that, you will not experience the joy of giving to someone. They walk in and you give them a sacred moment where we honor the birth of our Lord and Savior. But I can talk about it until blue in the face, but until you're willing to join and serve, you'll never feel it. I can't, I can't give it to you. If I could give you those feelings, I would, but that's not how life works. And again, when Jesus is asking us to serve, this is... God, this is perfect divinity telling you what's best for you. We're not all made to be preachers. We're not all made to be deacons. We all have a person. You know, I was thinking about this body analogy. And you can take metaphors too far by all means. So, so let's just, but I was, pondering this metaphor of a body, and I was thinking, you know what? And I was thinking in the context of those unwilling to commit to a church. Again, I recognize Alpha Baptist isn't everybody's style. I recognize not everybody wants to be around hardworking, honest, uh, you know, <laughs> hugging, right, huggers. I, I recognize there's people that don't want to be vulnerable, that don't want to connect. I recognize that people don't like Alpha Baptists. All right, we don't have a perfect choreography. You know, it's, we're a mess sometimes. I got it. But if you're unwilling to commit to this church, you need to leave. You need to leave and go find a church and commit to it. Let us know. We would love to. I, I'm not joking when I'm saying tell a pastor so we can pray you out the door. We wish you the, the best. We will pray for you, and we will pray that God shows you the church to go commit to with all honesty. Let us pray you out the door. But if you're not going to commit here, stop wasting time. If you're not going to commit to a church, just stop. Go fish. Go do something. Because you know what's funny? God asks us to be the body of Christ, which means you need to be something. Be an armpit. Be a navel. Uh, be a muscle. Be a tendon. Be that gristle part on the chicken you eat. I don't know. But, but find something in the body to be because you know what's interesting? What is, the, what is the one thing that passes from body to body to body? Germs, viruses, and disease. Now, I'm not saying that's what God meant by the metaphor. Don't, I don't, don't allow me to stretch too far. I just find that thought provoking. That if you're not part of the body and you just pass from body to body to body, always never committing, always never joining, always never doing anything, but you just want to go, you're like a virus. You're literally doing what a virus or a germ or a disease does. Food for thought. Now, the next thing we need to talk about is sacrifice. The other purpose of church is sacrifice. Right? And everybody loves to sacrifice. <laughs> uh, those of you with daughters understand it's, it's, it's a part of your heart that never gets unlocked. Like, remember when you were dating? And I, maybe I'm a child of the 80s, right? So, so I... For me, if I didn't eat a French fry, some child was starving in Africa. Like, that is what has been beat into my head. So I can't, I struggle to waste a single morsel of food. That's why it's a challenge for me. And so I grew up to be very disciplined in the sense that I, like, I only ordered what I was going to eat, right? If I order something, I'm going to eat every morsel that I order. That's just, just what was, was taught to me growing up in southern Alabama. 
So when you start dating in that first time, like your wife doesn't order dessert, right? Your future wife doesn't order dessert. And then she's like, oh, what? She starts picking at your dessert. You're almost like, what the, what the world's going on right now? Like, <laughs> like, I will order you a dessert if you want. But like, I literally was planning on that 12 bites of cheesecake. <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one that's this way. I probably am. So it's funny to me, my daughter has the same magical ability, right? It's just, ooh, it's just like, ooh, you know? That's a sacrifice, because initially I want to be like, ah, you know? That's... When we come to church, we're going to ask of your time. We're going to ask of your feelings, because we are filled with sinful people that are still struggling to walk with God. So we're oftentimes going to say things that are rude. We're oftentimes going to say things that are inappropriate. We're oftentimes not going to be gracious. We're oftentimes not going to have gratitude for what we do. We're going to have this whole laundry list of issues. But let me just say this. Every single person that walks through this door is coming here for connection. Every single person. And unfortunately, most of us are not going to be at, be at pride, uh, be at fear, be at whatever unnecessary thing is going to prevent most people from saying, brother, sister, I need. So what God has called each of us to do is to connect, to sacrifice of ourselves to go connect with a person and have a genuine relationship so that way when a life event happens, when something happens and they need, they have that connection there and they can reach out to that person. You can be a blessing to another person. You can be that power from God to bless another person if you're willing to build a relationship and connect with people. Any of you that's been married for more than five years know the fact that a marriage is probably the hardest thing you'll ever do in life. And if you don't invest in it, if you don't work at it, if you don't sacrifice for it, if you don't do things to build that marriage, it is going to be miserable. When you come to this church, you've got to be willing to make relationships. You've got to be willing to sacrifice to invest in other people because everybody's coming. That's what God wants, right? How can we be a body? How can, if the fingers refuse to talk to each other, Right? Let's work with this metaphor. A body is one united thing that works together in unison. In order to get that synergy, we've got to be willing to sacrifice and come together and do things. You've got to, we've, we have all humility, right? What is the definition of humility? Humility. The Bible defines it as to think of others more than ourself. It's that simple. That is genuine humility. That's why Moses was the most humble. He was always after the nation of Israel before he was concerned about his own needs. So when you come here to this church, we are coming here to bless each other. And when we bless each other inside this church, guess what's happened? Guess what happens with that synergy? We start being a lighthouse church to this lost world. We start drawing people to God. That was the whole purpose of the Old Testament and the nation of Israel was to be a lighthouse, was to draw people to God. And they refused to do it. They always went after false gods. They always refused to be obedient to God. Does that sound familiar? Right? What do we do today? We refuse to spend our time going after God and we refuse to be obedient to His commands. Right? And what happens? You can't draw the lost to his light if you are not simply pursuing God and obeying his commands. Listen and obey. It doesn't get any more complex than that. Those of you with children know this. It's that simple. Listen and obey. You will be blessed. God has commanded us. Come to church. Come together. Be the body of Christ. And now we can bless this lost world with his light. We can draw people. So now when people come through here and we maul them with hugs and we maul them with attention... Maybe they won't be a disease. Maybe they won't be a germ. Maybe they won't be a virus. Maybe they'll say, you know what? I'm ready to be an elbow tendon. Y'all need it? I'm ready. 
I will answer that call. I see an opportunity for me to step up and to be part of this church. I'm ready. But it starts with us. It starts with every one of us being willing to commit to this church. If this isn't your church, again, I'm not trying to be rude, but you need to leave and go find your church because you're wasting time. You're wasting your time. You're wasting God's time. If, if you don't want to commit to a church, stop going, honestly. Why, why are you going? It's like we don't ask non-believers to give to this church because it is a pointless endeavor. If you're not going to commit to a church in some way, if you're not going to say, this is my home church, I'm going to fight for it, I'm going to connect to people, I'm going to, I'm going to do what's asked of it, then why are you wasting your time? You're going to stand before guys and say, I, I never knew you, right? Not the church attendance saves you, but it authenticates what's in your heart. The Holy Spirit lives within you. Everyone, please, take assessment. Paul talks about it. The wise man reflects and looks on his life. You're saying you're asking too much, pastor. Okay, again, this is not me asking. This is me just proclaiming the truth. But you can always start out, we have a need in so many areas. And God will overwhelm you with blessings if you obey him. See, that's the part, and I, I can say it till I'm blue, but until you do it, you, you will never experience it. And I'm not saying you're going to, I'm not name it and claim it. You're not going to end up with Crayflow's private jet. I guess people don't know who Crayflow is, but okay, bad, bad joke. Anyway, blessings are not always material. I would argue they're very rarely material. Those of you that are in a healthy, happy marriage, is there any dollar amount that you would trade for the relationship that you're in? Right? So when you have looked back through the corridors of time and you look at all the stuff that you invest in that marriage, how many times you were disappointed, how many times you are angry, how many times you are frustrated, but you refused to give up, you depended on God, you invested in that relationship, you continue to pour out your heart, you continue to prioritize your spouse above the other relationships, not God, but other relationships, and you look back now and you have something that you've built that is priceless, literally priceless. This church is no different. If you will come, you will truly start connecting. If you will truly start getting involved, if you will truly commit, is it going to be hard? Yes, I can't stress this enough. This is not easy. It's not pleasant. Nothing worth having is ever easy. It is not always going to be fun. It's not always going to be rewarding. Not always going to be, uh, we're not always going to tell you thanks. If you ever need a hug, just tell Greg. I think Rod's a hugger too. So we got two huggers now on the pastoral staff. But God has promised that he will overflow your life with blessings if you obey him. So I'm going to leave us with this. Commit to church. For those of you that were going to walk out and say, well, you never covered a verse that said, I have to come to church. Because there's somebody out there, I know it's either in their head, right? Oh, oh, never. Here it is. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, not do the things I command you to do? Spent all this time just going over the whys and the hows before I bothered to tell you the command. There's no way out of it. And if you find that you're just knotted up, you're just like, oh, I just, you need to take that to the Lord. Because one of the fruits, one of the validation, one of the authentications of the fact that the Holy Spirit lives in your life is your love for the children of God. There's literally one of the key indicators, uh, I believe it's John 13, 34, don't quote me, but we will be known by what? Our love for the brethren. And that love is a willful love, a choice, a decision, not a feeling, not a reciprocal love. It is a love that no matter what you do, I am going to do those things that are loving. That is the love that is being referred to there.
Commit or leave. Right? That simple. I don't mean to be that harsh. But what I don't want is two things. There's two judgments, I'll remind you. There's a great white throne judgment, which every person who's decided not to accept the blood of Jesus Christ will stand before God, and the sentence is already, the condemnation is already certain. It is simply a way that God is going to demonstrate through their life that they never chose him. And they will be ushered into eternal separation. So I don't want people sitting in this church for year after year after year thinking that they were a child of God and for God to tell them, I never knew you, depart from me. And I can't tell you that from a sermon, but what I can tell you, if you don't have a love for his word, if you don't have a love for other children, God, the Bible says, that is a pretty clear indication that you're not his child. So if you don't love the children of God, you really need to think about where you're, where you're at with God. Now, the second judgment is the Bema Seat judgment, which is where all who have chosen to accept the blood of Christ have been saved forever, once and for all, will stand before. And I find it very interesting that after the new heaven and earth, uh, Revelation 21, 4-ish, it talks about Jesus wiping away every tear. Now, think about that. Why would Jesus need to wipe away any tears after the new heaven new earth? My opinion from Bible study is that that will be the Bema Seat Judgment. And if you look back to 1 Corinthians, oh, I had it written down somewhere. I believe it's 1 Corinthians, public math, you never do in public. I can't find where I wrote it down. 1 Corinthians, somewhere Paul talks about that at the Bema Seat Judgment, there are some believers who will escape the judgment as if they escaped a fire. Do you understand that? Like literally, you just jumped out of a burning house and the only thing you saved were the singed clothes on your back. That's how people's judgment, their entire life is gonna be tested by divine fire and literally nothing, nothing will have survived it except their very own life. I believe that is a connection to Revelation 21, 4, because every tear will be wiped away. I think that is the beam of seat judgment. I think that is where you will bawl your eyes out in the recognition that you literally wasted your life. Because you didn't invest in relationships. You didn't invest in those things that truly matter that you will take to the other side of glory. So you're in here today. We all have the chance to repent. We all have the chance to start taking stock of our life to say, what am I doing that matters, right? How can I stop wasting what I've been given? How can I stop doing things that mean nothing? And what can I do to invest in relationships? I can serve others. I can sacrifice. I can be part of the synergy of this church that is getting the word of God out. So I just want to ask each of you today, when you go home in your own quiet place when your prayer to take stock of where you are. Either commit to this church in some way. And again, if you're a family, your family is your focus right now, but commit to this church. Let us know we're not your style. Let us pray you out. Let us help you find a church that is your style. Or just stop wasting your time. Enjoy the fun while you have it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day and thank you for the chance just to live in a land where we can always still proclaim your truth. And Lord, though I didn't stress enough in the sermon, this is such a, such a blessed church. We have so many people that volunteer. We have so many people that give. We have so many people that make this church and proper lives. And though I'm preaching to the minority today, I just pray that those individuals will take the time to assess where they stand with you and to assess what it is they can do to serve. You've given us the individual responsibility to 
ensure that our relationship with you is good and we take that out to our family and from our family we bring it here to church. Lord, I pray that everybody understands that prioritization. Lord, I want to thank everyone who's committed to this church so we can be a lighthouse because we all want to stand before you at the BME seat judgment so that we can take pride in the fact that we invested in what you, the perfect king, asked us to do. And we do that because you gave us everything. You gave us what we didn't deserve. You gave us your perfect righteousness. You gave us life. And for that, we praise your name and we worship you. Amen.